Hello, I'm Jason Cahoot, a partner here at Foley and Lardner, and I'm here with Emmeline Dragana, an associate in our estate and trust area. We want to talk today about private foundation succession. So we put together a little webinar here. It's been broken into different parts, and we'll go through and talk a little bit about this very important topic. We work with a number of private foundations of family foundations and company foundations in this area. Throughout this webinar, we'll talk about different tools that you can use to, to plan your private foundation succession planning. But before you get there, we want to give a quick introduction to the general overview and principles that you want to think about when you're planning your foundation succession planning. The bottom line question in private foundation succession planning is how will the foundation make decisions when the current decision makers are not around anymore? There are different approaches to this question and there's no one right answer. It really depends on what the donor or the founder of the private foundation wants. It also depends on how much control and certainty the trustees and directors and other current decision makers wish to have over future generations of decision makers. One thing to note, however, is that the bylaws or trust agreement or other governing documents of the private foundation may already have provisions that address succession planning. But too often we see that these provisions are general or boilerplate. They may have been thrown together when the private foundation was established, but they weren't well thought out. To really think about your succession planning, you're going to want to think about those issues now, and you can always revise these provisions if they are in your governing documents. Yeah, I would I would say in our experience, you know, many people come to us and say, I would like a private foundation, you know, to get a current income tax deduction or because it's part of an estate plan but they don't necessarily, and we don't push them, or for whatever reason, they haven't made decisions or they've made placeholder decisions. And I think what this webinar is about is taking that second step and saying, okay, there will be a significant private foundation here. What are, the, what are we gonna think about when it comes to the next, the next generation of decision-making? The main issue when you're thinking about this kind of second level decision making is concerning the purpose of the foundation. Why was the foundation made? Was it to support the donor's specific philanthropic vision? Did he have specific causes or charities that he wanted to support? Or was it more to provide an opportunity for family members to set their own course, perhaps to provide a philanthropic legacy for future family members, but also flexibility so those family members could carve their own path? So donors should consider, does the donor want to restrict the foundation to a specific cause or project or provide a family vehicle for his family to promote their own services and philanthropic bent? This is really a spectrum, as you can see here. Foundations may be focused on donor intent. Those are the foundations where the donor has a specific cause or charitable purpose that he wants to promote or they may be independent or flexible. This is where the, the donor just wants his family and his legacy to be charitable and to give them a charitable vehicle. And then from there, you're going to decide, are there other purposes? Are you only focused on family involvement? How flexible or strict are you going to be? As an estate planner, this is where things become fun or difficult for our clients because they have to weigh, they have to think about what exactly is their purpose. We have a number of clients, we have a number of very charitable clients. It's always fun to work with those clients, but um, it is difficult. You know, sometimes it can be difficult to run through, which we're going to hope to today and really have them think about, you know, when they're not here, what's going to happen to this money and how should it be? How should it do good in the world? Right? It's one thing to say charity, another thing to say, OK, here's where we're going to be a philanthropist and here's how we're going to make a difference in the world. Throughout this presentation, we'll go through different examples of other foundations that have grappled with these same issues. One foundation you may want to think about here is the Ford Foundation. The Ford Foundation was founded in the 1930s by Henry Ford's son, Etzel Ford, and it had a very general mission statement at that time, similar to the general mission statements that we often see on a lot of forum documents. During Henry Ford and Etzel's life, this wasn't an issue because they were very involved with the foundation. After they died, however, their successors were left without specific guidance because it wasn't in these form documents. They didn't have a specific uh, succession plan that could inform their successor decision makers. Etzel's son, Henry Ford II, became president and the foundation expanded its grant making beyond Michigan. It's now headquartered in New York. And after Henry Ford II left the board, there are decades where no Ford family member was on the board at all. At present, the Ford Foundation has assets of approximately 12.5 billion and is one of the largest foundations in the world. 
It's involved in many innovative projects nationally and internationally. So depending on where you are on that spectrum that we talked about previously, this may seem like a really great success. Um, the, the Ford Foundation is able to adapt, its successor decision makers are able to carve their own path and, and use the assets of the Ford Foundation to do great charitable good in the world. However, if you're a very donor intent focused uh, foundation, the, found the Ford Foundation may be viewed as a failure. Certainly Henry Ford II thought that the foundation in its modern iteration was not something that Edsel Ford had ever envisioned. When the foundation started, its donors were centered in Detroit and they were capitalistic minded. They probably didn't envision a foundation that's now centered in New York and has not been eager to fund Michigan charities. So like we said at the beginning of this presentation, there's no right or wrong answer. You could see the Ford Foundation as a great success and this could be how you want to model your own uh, foundation succession planning, or you could see it as not what your plans are for your own foundation because it has strayed from what its donors probably originally intended. Yeah, we really we see. People thinking all different things um, definitely have clients who come in and say, you know, I, I want an expert or I want to put someone into my shoes who would make good decisions and I want to give them a broad scope, right? To be able to decide what what should happen now uh, and you know, new things come up. There's a pandemic or something like that that comes out of uh, nowhere that the foundation is that, that their funds are able to uh, change and, and do that. We also have other clients who are very focused. They would want to make sure that the rules of the road are established because they have very specific ideas about how the fund should be spent. And they would be disappointed if the, if the funds were spent outside of outside of that role. All right, for the remainder of the presentation, we're going to go through different tools that uh, that donors and foundation succession planning planners have in their toolbox when they're thinking about this overarching idea of what is the purpose of the foundation? Is it donor intent focused or is it more flexible? And how do I want to plan for my own foundation succession planning? These tools are going to be thinking about your mission statement, thinking about how to choose your successor decision makers, thinking about checks and balances that you may want to implement, thinking about spend down or division provisions that you may want to implement, and also thinking about an enhanced flexibility to allow you to adapt to new ways of charitable giving that may come after your foundation is established. Your first tool is going to be thinking about your mission statement. Obviously, your mission statement is going to be charitable. It's going to probably reflect the, the 501c3 tax exempt charitable purposes of charitable, educational, scientific, etc. But a mission statement should also reflect the donor specific purposes, especially if you are a donor intent focused charitable foundation. What this means is you need to have a statement that tells your successor decision makers, yes, this is what the donor would have wanted, or no, this isn't what the donor would have wanted. Of course, if, you, if your foundation is established more to allow your, your successor decision makers and, and future generations to carve their own way and have their own philanthropic legacy, then you may want to think about what your future family members think or what your current family members think. You also may want to incorporate some flexibility so that your mission statement can be refined or added to as your foundation adapts and changes. Overall, the donor's guiding principle and how that principle impacts the rest of your choices is what you want to encompass in your mission statement. Here we have some examples of the spectrum of mission statements. So on the far left, you can see the mission statement here is give one third of the foundation's annual distribution amount to the art museum. That's going to tell your future decision makers very clearly what you want. They're not going to have to guess yes or no. They're going to know that you wanted to give one third of your annual distribution amount to this cause. As you move to the right, uh, you can get a little more flexible. Hold is a perpetual endowment, but generally continue to fund arts organizations in the same manner as during my life. The idea of this mission statement is that instead of future decision makers uh, thinking the foundation is about arts and we want to support arts and um, we would each have our own thoughts about that. You're supposed to think what would the donor want and how did he fund during his life? Then the next mission statement you can see this is less about what the donor would have done during his life, but more that the donor wanted future generations to support arts and how they in, in their own discretion. As long as it would not be offensive to, to what the donor would have wanted during his life. Then as you continue to the right, you can see support innovative arts in Wisconsin, including new organizations, artists and projects. This gives your future decision makers a lot of flexibility. They can choose their own causes. They can choose the type of arts that they're passionate about. 
and they may even choose to support arts or organizations or projects that that weren't around or weren't envisioned by the donor when they established the foundation. The last one, make the world a more beautiful place, is probably not a mission statement that we would recommend because it doesn't give your future decision makers any guidance um, or any any indication of what the donor would have wanted. Then again, it, it's very flexible and, and perhaps your future decision makers can make it their own. Yeah, I would, you know, we have, we've administered trusts of all types. And we've seen um, these very different approaches. There is a, it's a spectrum. So there are, we, we do have donors who really are looking for their future decision makers, knowing that the world is gonna be a different place, the discretion to say, how are you gonna do it? They, they, it's essentially saying, I'm not gonna be around here, but we're really challenging our next, next generation or our next set of leaders to decide how to make the world a better place, a more beautiful place or a better place, right? Very broad, but um, there can be rewards in that because that is gonna allow the foundation the flexibility to make different decisions or have some creativity or find out what's going to happen in the future. Nobody understood that we'd have um, uh, NFT and artwork that's now part of the digital space, right? That wasn't something that could have been jumped up even 20 years ago, right? But <clears throat> we see significantly uh, sometimes we have clients who say, but I really, I do have a very specific vision Oftentimes, I will say in drafting the mission statement, I have clients who I know have a specific vision. Um, and I really have to tease that out because they will uh, sometimes they'll draft a mission statement and it won't answer the key question, which is what should we fund or what shouldn't we fund? And it's actually it's broader than they would like. So I think a, a donor who's going through this, a, a client or a donor is going through this process has to really ask themselves, is this as specific as I want, or if it's broad, am I am I okay with the amount of discretion that I'm providing? So just to reiterate, your mission statement should be focused on the donor intent, whether that is to give your future decision makers uh, their own flexibility, or whether it's um, something specific that the donor has in mind. Some ways to focus this foundation's the foundation's future giving, or some ways that the donor may think about how they want to craft their own mission statement is. Uh, geographic, do you, do you have a state or a city or a county that you're very focused on uh, charitable giving to? Or certain areas such as arts, education, uh, social service agencies that the donor is passionate about or hopes that their future decision makers will be passionate about? Or does the donor have specific goals like supporting veterans, um, equal opportunities, or the promotion of health that they would like to give their future decision makers general guidelines to make grants and fund projects in those specific areas but the future decision makers can uh, see see what's happened, adapt to the world, and uh, fund grants and projects that they think would be in the best interest of the foundation after the donor is no longer around. And here we're just providing ways in which if you're a you're in this situation, you're thinking about what's our plan. And I've seen so many people put either everything they put in everything in the kitchen sink, or they have a they have a blank slate and they don't really know how to fill it up. Many times what we say is, you know, really start to think about areas of giving or geography. You know, many times it's, um, you know, I'm, I made my life in this city, so I want to support things in this city for the population in this city or this state. A foundation you may want to consider when you're thinking about this specific tool in your toolbox is the Kamehameha Schools Foundation. When Princess Bernice Bahawi established uh, the Kamehameha Schools Foundation, she was guided by a very specific mission statement to create educational opportunities in perpetuity to improve the capability and well-being of people of Hawaiian ancestry. Her mission was to create and maintain Hawaiian culture through education, as she was one of the last members of the Hawaiian royal family. So you can see here how a donor with a very specific purpose may craft his or her mission statement differently than a donor with a more general purpose. This trust is an example of a mission statement that's very far to the donor intent side of the spectrum. And Princess Bernice was very specific about her instructions, going so far as to further mandate that all teachers within the school system be Protestant and that the school should incorporate a strong preference for children of native Hawaiian descent. And the school really hasn't wavered from her intent. It's only admitted two non-Hawaiian students since 1965. 
and it only began allowing non-Protestant teachers in 1993 after a court decision um, that pushed it that way. So for a donor for whom intent, intent is paramount, the Kamehameha Schools Trust is an example of a really great success. Um, Princess Bernice stopped being involved with the foundation uh, many generations ago, but the foundation and the trust is still carrying out her wishes very specifically. However, the trust now has an endowment of approximately 11 billion and it's the largest private landowner in Hawaii. So for a donor whose primary purpose is more charitable good um, and charitable legacy, the fact that these, so, these funds are, are so restricted, likely not even in a way that Princess Bernice could have anticipated, uh, may not be what she would have wanted if she had known at the time. Changing circumstances. Absolutely. Right. But we, you know, again, there, there, we're gonna, we have, we have everybody on the spectrum. You have to just, it's really a balancing act of exactly how you're gonna approach this. It can be, it's actually one of the um, pretty rewarding as an attorney to work through something that, and, and the issue here is that these funds could be around in perpetuity, which is a long time. So it, it's 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 really important to kind of think through if you're going to do something specific. Is there some escape valve, or uh, if you're going to do something broad, is there something? You know, are you giving sufficient guidance to making sure that you, whatever your intent or your vision is is being reflected in that mission statement? The second tool in your toolbox is going to be choosing your successor trustees. This is really important. It's not just um, naming successor trustees, but it's also training, onboarding, and thinking about what you're looking for in your successor trustees or decision makers. A foundation to consider when you're thinking about this is the Charles Stewart, Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. Um, very similar to the Ford Foundation that we talked about uh, in other sections, how you view the Charles Mott Foundation main form, how you want to structure your own foundation succession planning, and choosing your successor decision makers. Charles Mott's goal was to have his family serve on the foundation board down through generations, and he has achieved this. Members of Mott's family continue to serve the foundation, and his great-grandson is currently chairman and president. However, that doesn't mean that his foundation's activities have not changed. He allowed flexibility, knowing that his family would be carrying out his goals and that he wanted his family to be able to carve their own philanthropic paths. Mr. Mott started out funding hyper-local projects, specifically spearheading a community schools effort in Flint. Now, after, after many decades, the main focus of the Mott Foundation is civil society, education, environment in the Flint area. And the foundation seeks to fulfill its mission of supporting efforts that promote a just, equitable, and sustainable society, which was Mott's goal, um, using Mott's belief in the partnership of humanity simply as a guiding principle. So Charles Mott's family have has refined and adapted his original mission statement, um, which is what he wished um, as he, he wanted his family to, to serve on the foundation and continue it and adapt it so that it could continue to be relevant in these times. This really returns to the idea of the spectrum that we've been talking about throughout this presentation. If Mott wanted the purpose of the foundation to be giving his family a charitable vehicle, the Mott Foundation can be seen as really successful, and his mission statement, relatively general, was well chosen. But if this was not Mott's intent, um, then, or if this not, isn't uh, your donor's intent, then a more specific mission could have helped him um, shape the future of his foundation while still allowing his family members to succeed him, but with some more guidance. So the selection of your success, uh, successor decision makers um, is going to be, who do you want to perpetuate the foundation's purposes? And who do you trust to perpetuate the foundation's purposes as you see them? You want to choose people with good judgment and you wanna make sure that the persons that you choose are trained and onboarded. You wanna make sure that they're provided guidance you want to prepare them for leadership before they they get there, before they're placed on the foundation's board or as a main decision maker. That's why you'd want to be thinking about this now instead of scrambling to think about it after the donor donor is no longer involved. There's also additional layers to consider. If your foundation is more family focused, what family members will serve? We often see um, uh, two spouses perhaps set up a foundation and they assume that their children will uh, serve on the board after they are no longer involved. 
what happens if one of your children uh, doesn't wish to serve? Or what happens if your children don't get along or don't see eye to eye on certain issues or don't agree on the charitable purposes or projects that that your foundation is going to serve? There's different options here. Yeah, we see different, you know, certainly an understanding of, OK, so will they all be equal? Are they all going to be on the board of directors? If it's a large enough private foundation, there may be one family member who's going to step forward and be sort of the executive director. You know, if that's the case or the president, right? If that's the case, you just want to be thoughtful about are you are they going to be OK with that? And then it ans it asks other questions, which is one may be the leader. Maybe that makes sense. I've seen a lot of families that have been very successful. I would say, you know, they, they just have really talented children. And they've got one ch child who takes the lead on philanthropy, and maybe there's another child who takes the lead in business, right? Or something like that. I've seen a lot of really well thought out thoughts like that. On the other hand, sometimes, you know, you need to be understanding that, um, people don't see eye to eye and they grow apart over time. That's where we do see, you know, there may be a need for uh, an independent trustee or a third party to at least make sure that the, the trains run on time, so to speak, the tax returns get filed and the distributions are made and that sort of thing. Um, one thing that is very important, and, and so I would circle back on the compensation question, um, you wanna be clear, especially if you've got family members involved, you know, thinking about if someone is doing more work, should they be paid for it? There's arguments on both sides. Some family members, you know, families, it's this is philanthropy. We're not being paid. On the other side, there is this thought that if there's something valuable being done, somebody should be compensated for it because then it's a way to show that it is valuable. Um, also, when you're thinking about family members, sometimes there's this real thought that well, if every family member is involved, they'll all be equal and they'll all get a little part of the foundation or a portion of the distribution to make distributions from. Sometimes family members are really explicit in the documents. They say, that's exactly what I want. I want Joe to give funds to where he lives and what he's involved in, and Sally should give funds to what she wants to be involved in. That that's that could be a very good way to do it. Or you may have family members and um, you may have uh, clients or donors who say, I really want them, they have a vision of the family coming together and evaluating donees and, and possible grantees, right, as what I would call a community exercise. Usually around the holidays, right, we all come together and we work together to make decisions, kind of thinking about, you know, what's, what would our family, what, what does our family want to do in the world? And then lastly, we do like in selecting successors, there are some people who I would say would be more donor intent focused, right? So if you're going to be, let's say you, you have very specific vision for this foundation, you, you don't want to uh, pass on and hear about it later that uh, the funds were used for something that you don't, um, you, you would not have wanted. So they're yet to be focused on successor trustees or directors, right? De successor decision makers who share your values right and principles and then in at some level you also want to think about people who are you know experts in those fields like if you're really interested in a specific kind of social service or you know very active philanthropy around um, policy making or something like that i think you're going to be focused on finding successors who are pretty involved right through other areas right either their their work or through their interests they're very involved in kind of that specific um concept or the specific area that you're worried about i i had a client who was very interested in biotech research right so he has a professor who's going to be a, a trustee um, i think with some other family members and then lastly and this could be the same thing right representatives of charity so if you're thinking hey this is really about making grants to the art museum. It may make sense to have someone who is on the board of the art museum or someone who's going to be representative of the art museum to be a, a successor trustee. Just to reiterate what Jason touched on in the last slide, you know, oftentimes we see when someone sets up a foundation, 
they may choose the, the second generation of decision makers, and then they assume that those decision makers will choose their own successors, which is fine. That could be um, exactly right for, for your foundation. But you could also consider alternatives, such as, um, like Jason mentioned, give a charity the right to appoint a representative. If you have a very specific charity or even a, a specific um, uh, cause, then you could choose a charity to kind of serve as a check or just to make sure that, that your voice is still there after you're no longer around. Or you could give the, an independent trustee the ability to appoint his own successor independent trustee. So you could appoint an independent trustee. Maybe this is a trusted advisor or your attorney or someone else who um, is, is maybe not a part of your family, could act as a neutral third party, could break some ties, could also make sure that the administrative things get done, that the tax return is filed and your state filings are done. And then he may he may be in a good position to appoint his successor when the time comes, especially if you're having uh, maybe other members of your family appoint their own successors. I think, you know, Emily and I, we, we've created so many private foundations and the answers to these questions currently for people is it's basically whatever the form was on the day that they created the foundation, right? And, and you know, maybe they were young and in, in creating the foundation or weren't terribly focused on it. I think this is a great this is a great second level topic. This is we we're now established and now I'm thinking, boy, who's gonna make decisions when I'm not around? And that's where you sort of go back and you look at the either the trust document, the bylaws, and you consider changes that that kind of tie back to, you know, what is this foundation? How is it going to operate when our donor's not around? To add to Jason's point, though, the legal documents alone are not enough. Even if you change your bylaws um, to, to more fully encompass your vision for your successor decision makers. You're also going to want to make sure that your successor decision makers themselves are, are ready because they're they're the only people that are going to be perpetuating your vision and your mission after you're no longer there. Um, things to think about are advisory boards so they can serve on, a, on kind of a sub board and learn the ropes and learn what the mission and the foundation is all about before they are um, ready to lead as a decision maker. Um, you can also make their service subject to removal and replacement just in case um, it's not working out or it's not what they want, then you can have a, a good kind of exit strategy to make sure that all of your successor decision makers are, are able to carry on the mission of your foundation in an effective way. I think it's just prudent advice. I don't think it's ground shake, uh, you know, um, uh, ground shaking, right? But once you've thought about who is going to be dis making decisions when I'm not here, it really, and it's a service to them, it's a service to you and your vision to bring them in sooner rather than later, right? Because um, if, if you think that by writing a really good mission statement and then giving to them on the first day of the job and then not being around to help them, that's one way to do it, but I don't think it's the most successful, right? We know that in good organizations, when we prepare, when we mentor, and we pr provide opportunities for involvement, that's where we have success. Every it, People know that, we know that, right? So options would be, you know, maybe you don't bring on someone, if you, you, you're the trustee, maybe you don't bring on a, you know, a co-trustee who ultimately could block you, right? I, it is important not to give up control too quickly before someone has maybe proven themselves or at least until you're comfortable. So two options, as Emmeline said, would be creating an advisory board, right? Allowing people to come to the meetings, see how decisions are made, allow them to voice decisions, right? In a number of instances, we have family members who are part of the philanthropy, but um, you know, and they feel like they're very involved. Uh, we just don't um, really dwell on the fact that you know it's the decision is made by the trustee and that they are. Uh, uh, something of an advisory board, right? But they feel that they're involved and they feel they understand what mom and or dad or mom and dad are doing, right? And and they're able to step into their shoes, hopefully by, by learning, by doing, right? We also have a num number of private foundations in which we do have uh, mom and dad uh, be the, what's called a member or have the ability to add people 
right? Add other uh, uh, trustees or directors, but then also if there was an issue that developed, right, has the ability to remove and replace that that person or that decision maker, you know, and we've seen that um, there's a number of court cases in which, right, people have been removed, right, because there have been, you know, uh, situations that developed, but that can be an effective way to bring people into the into the fold for the foundation.